honor to have with us here today Professor Joel Robbins from the University of Cambridge, where he is the secret browsing professor of social anthropology and the deputy head of the department. Uh, professor Robbins is uh, one of the leading, if not the leading, scholars on anthropology of Christianity, in addition to which, as most of you know, is very well known for his uh, work on developing anthropological theory, uh, ethics, morals, values, and especially the anthropology of good in, in recent, recent times. And as you well know, he's most famous for his ethnographic work with the Iraq men in Papua New Guinea. And he's also very well known to us here in, in Finland. In 2011, Joel gave the Western Mark Memorial Lecture. And in 2013, at 14, he worked at the Collegium as a visiting, visiting professor. And currently, he's at, in the, on the editorial board of our journal, Women Anthropology. So we are very, very pleased to have you here. Joel, the floor is yours. this talk, I'm, 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 uh, I, I'm giving a talk in the department tomorrow, and when uh, Timo invited me, I said there, there are two papers I want to give, and I can't decide which one. Sort of inevitably, he chose one, and I said, oh, darn, I'm not going to just give the other one. And then he wrote, and so now I'm, I'm having my cake and eating it, too, but I don't know where that leaves you guys. Um, because I should confess that this is a... a this is a, a, a bit of a, an unusual paper, at least for me. I, it's part of a, it was written as part of a series of six um, lectures on the theme of anthropology and theology that I just finished giving at the Divinity School at Cambridge, and called the Stanton Lectures. So it was really written for an interdisciplinary audience and sort of toward a theologic, theological audience, but knowing there would be anthropologists there too. So it's pretty experimental. Um, and there will be moments in it where it'll sound like I'm saying extremely basic, fundamental things about anthropology. But the framework around the whole set of lectures, you know, anthropology these days is, um, is uh, become very creative about where it gets its concepts. We can get our concepts from Melanesians, we can get our concepts from Amazonian peoples, we can get our concepts in all kinds of places. And it occurred to me, well, why not theology? If we can get them from all these other places, why not there? And so that's sort of the framework around this set of, I see, I can't look better. <laughs> uh, I will stay in my space. Um, it was just an hour ago that I was putting my seat back to its original position, so I'm used to these. Okay, um, so, it, um, so, the, so the notion, the idea is, how can we see anthropology differently in a sense by looking at it from the vantage point of theology and, and what theology does. This particular paper or lecture takes the approach, uh, uh, and it's slightly different from the others, and taking the approach of examining an expression of Christianity that, that anthropologists and theologians alike struggle to come to grips with. Um, and what I, what I want to do in this talk is describe this kind of Christianity and some of the troubled responses it's met with from the pens of both anthropologists and theologians. And then I want to look at the distinct ways scholars in both fields have attempted to move beyond these initial negative reactions. And my aim is to show that by gathering around a version of Christianity about which neither side is given to wholly confident um, positive pronouncements, we might discover some surprising ways anthropologists can learn from theologians, and perhaps vice versa, theologians can learn from anthropologists around topics of judgment and the nature of humanity. So the paper doesn't start with issues of judgment and the nature of humanity, but that's what it's built into by looking at the ways these two different disciplines approach one kind of Christianity that they both find it somewhat difficult to get to grips with. And the, the kind of Christianity that I have in mind uh, goes by a lot of different names. It's often called the prosperity gospel, and that's the term I'll use here. But it can also be referred to as the health and wealth gospel, or positive confession, or the word of faith gospel. And preachers in this tradition exhort their congregants to recognize that God has promised them, indeed through Christ's atonement, has contractually obligated himself to provide them with material plenty and good health on earth. All they need to do to claim what is rightfully theirs is believe strongly, tithe regularly, and claim from God, or as movement jargon has it, positively confess to God 
what it is that they want and that they need. In many, but not all of these churches, believers spend much of their time battling evil powers that are understood to hold them back from achieving the success that God wants them. Ritual life, which is extensive, takes the form of efforts to strengthen oneself for battle by calling on God to give one power and by entreating God and the Holy Spirit to banish evil forces from one's life. The prosperity gospel developed in part out of the, the Pentecostal movement, which has done so much to bring both the anthropology of Christianity and the, the notion of world Christianity into being. That kind of refers back to something I had said in a previous lecture in this set, that one reason that now is an interesting time to put theology and anthropology in dialogue is that over the same two decades that anthropology was finally kind of accepting the possibility of, of studying Christianity in anthropological ways, theology was discovering something they called world Christianity. And they, and they were doing that by looking at Christianity in the kinds of places that in the past anthropologists had more often worked than they had. And I, I argued there that the global spread of Pentecostalism had a lot to do with both of those developments, the development of the anthropology of Christianity and the development of the notion of world of world Christianity, and this prosperity gospel comes out of that same Pentecostal movement. At the same time, though, that it comes out of the same movement that has helped both of these intellectual trends develop, the prosperity gospel has often been hard for both anthropologists and theologians to welcome into their vision of the faith. And this, no matter how capacious these visions have recently become, anthropologists can tolerate a lot of times Christianity now. Theologians are very interested in of non-canonical forms of Christianity, but the prosperity gospel still lies just at the edge of what both scholarly camps are comfortable with. Many responses to the prosperity gospel from both quarters, that is from anthropology and theology, have been flatly negative in their evaluations of what many take to be a form of Christianity that preys on the poor and needy, taking what little believer have, believers have in ties extracted through the cultivation of false hopes of spectacular return. Pentecostal theologian Robert Bowman, for example, calls the prosperity gospel, quote, Pentecostalism at its parentheses near, close parentheses, worse. Which makes you wonder what, uh, what he's thinking of. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he called the Pentecostal as its near worse. And Rob Starner, another Pentecostal theologian, defines the prosperity gospel, quote, as a sort of division within the ranks of Christendom. Martin Percy, who's a very influential theologian and sociologist, suggests that the prosperity gospel is more prone than many other strands of Christianity to becoming what he calls abusive religion. In anthropology, too, with a few brave exceptions I'll mention later, until quite recently, most of those willing to risk joining the move to studying Christianity seem to find prosperity gospel churches to be still too unattractive to make for good anthropological research, and most manage to steer clear of them. Of those anthropologists who did take early notice of the prosperity gospel, of gospel's increasing influence, many followed the Comoros and lumping it in with what they call, following the remark of Evans Pritchard's that he made in a different context, forms of new magic for new times, such as witchcraft beliefs that hold that witches kill in order to create some workforces under their own control. Folded in with such magical trends, the prosperity gospel figures as a component of what the Comoros call occult economies phantasmagoric cultural formations that they argue represent people's failed attempts to understand the vast new neoliberal economy they have been forced to join or to try to join but cannot really comprehend. This approach makes no attempt to reckon with the specificities of the prosperity gospel as an outgrowth of the Christian tradition or to treat it as a faith that both leaders and followers are highly committed to seeing as still within that tradition's boundaries. It gets folded in with all, all kinds of other religious religious phenomenon. But even as such frankly negative responses to the prosperity gospel have been influential in both anthropology and theology, there have also recently appeared more sober assessments of this form of the faith. What's of interest here is the different shapes these reconsiderations have taken in each discipline. I want to argue that these differences reveal some unexpected common ground between the two fields in regard to how they think about the nature of humanity even as they also highlight a profound difference between them when it comes to matters of judgment. On the way to making this argument, I'm going to first consider some of the more temperate recent responses in each discipline separately. So I'm first going to talk about how anthropologists have started to, to treat the prosperity gospel a bit more seriously, then I'm going to look at how theologians have done it, and then out of the differences in the ways each discipline has done it, I'm going to move on to these topics of judgment and, and the nature of humanity. 
So this section of the paper is called Anthropology and the Prosperity Gospel as Culture and Ethics. Amongst themselves, the anthropologists often, and as I did promise, there'll be a few moments in this paper, they will be quick, so I'm really saying very, very basic things about anthropology to theologians, so bear with me. But also, it's sometimes fun to think about when you boil anthropology down, what you're left with. Amongst themselves, anthropologists often joke that one reason they have trouble capturing the attention of a wide public, even on prominent issues about, what they clearly, about which they clearly have something to say, is that their answer to every question tends to be, as Webb Keen puts it, you know, well, it's complicated. <laughs> the serious point buried in this self-deprecatory observation is that anthropology at its best looks at how the different parts of a cultural formation are, are tied together in kinds of knots that often are, in fact, quite intricate. And anthropologists insist that when one looks at a cultural formation in this way, none of its strands will appear to be freakish or bluntly irrational nor will they evidence the simple ignorance of those who live in light of them. Even the prosperity gospel turns out to be susceptible to such treatment. On careful analysis, it usually turns out to be more than merely a confused attempt to construe the neoliberal world or a sop to people's worst selfish tendencies, standing instead as a cultural phenomenon that fosters meaningful links between the various values by which believers aim to live their lives. Simon Coleman and Catherine Wiley are two scholars who represent exceptions to the rule that early anthropologists tended to recoil from prosperity gospel churches or to treat their members as engaged in misguided attempts to understand the global market economy. In a major ethnography of a Swedish prosperity church called the Word of Life, Coleman reveals the faith of its members to be anchored in a complex cultural logic in which gifts of speech, time, and money, when invested in projects of church growth and expansion, are understood to come back to believers through long chains of reciprocity in which God has a hand. Notable in his argument is the way the prosperity, the, the, the way prosperity gospel ideas that look so out of touch with reality when interpreted through the lens of market logics fit quite well with gift economy models in which, as Levi Strauss showed long ago in his discussion of generalized exchange, people often expect returns to come from parties other than the ones to whom they have given gifts and in which the expansion of networks of exchange is itself a substantial reward on investment. In a similar cultural analytic fashion, why do we have furthered Coleman's argument and tested it in a context in which many believers live more precarious lives than the Swedes that Coleman studied? She carried out research with a hugely popular Catholic prosperity movement in the Philippines known as El Shaddai, recognized by the Catholic Church as a legitimate expression of its charismatic renewal. Spectacularly successful at the task Coleman has identified of expanding its networks, El Shaddai was, when widely studied it, a movement with roughly 10 million followers around the world. Yeah, that's not a mystery. <laughs> 10 million, that's a lot. In objective terms, many of these followers are not well off, and they do not take material effective steps to becoming so through their participation in the movement, widely tells us. Why, then, do they continue to believe in the prosperity theology that El Shaddai propounds? One of these key findings is that they do so because through participation in the movement's ritual life, with its focus on listening to sermons, making prayer requests, positive confession, healing, and testifying about what God has given them, they learn to reinterpret their lives in gift exchange terms by focusing on the good things that do happen to them and defining these, no matter their earthly source, as blessings given to them by a supporting God. Recent anthropological studies have developed in new ways the trend initiated by Coleman and Wybery of showing the sense prosperity churches make in their own contexts. Some of these have sought to show that prosperity churches are market. <laughs> Did you want me to repeat? <laughs> uh, okay. Recent anthropological studies. Uh, yes. Okay. Some of, um, where, where were we? Yeah. <laughs> recent, recent anthropological studies have developed in new ways the trend initiated by Coleman and Widely of showing the sense prosperity churches make in their own context. Some of these have also sought to show that prosperity churches are marked by a level of ethical concern that passing observers tend to miss in their rush to see them as fools for what they take to be a distinctively capitalist kind of selfishness. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate your agreement. Uh, it's really fine with me. Uh, but, uh, sorry. 
<laughs> Karen Laberback, uh, working with emerging prosperity pastors in the largely Asante Ghanaian city of Kumasi, shows how potential church members and young pastors are both concerned that all pastors live up to an ethical ideal they refer to as truthfulness. Truthfulness is in part a matter of sincerity, matching one's speech to one's thoughts, one's thoughts and then later backing them up in action. A set of ideas that anthropologists have long seen as important to many strands of Christianity. But in prosperity churches, notions of truthfulness also pay particular attention to pastors' willingness, pastors' willingness to follow a set of rules for how they should relate to wealth. By the lights of this code, it is right that prosperity preachers denounce poverty itself, and it's right that they encourage their followers to want to overcome this state by improving their material condition. It's also ethically appropriate that they loosen the strictures on consumption that are in place in more aesthetically minded churches, including the older Pentecostal ones. But in keeping with traditional Asante norms, wealth among these pastors and among members of their flocks should not be accumulated solely for personal ends. It must be used to build up the community, which for truthful pastors can be their churches. So if they just hoard the money for themselves, that, that doesn't really count as well. Again, working in Ghana, the country in Africa with the largest popular proportion of Christians, and not coincidentally the source of many of the most important works in the anthropology of Christianity, Girish Daswani has also demonstrated in detail that within prosperity gospel understandings, prosperity and wealth are complex notions, deeply embedded in cultural and ethical logics that require a good deal of ethnographic work to understand. In a recently published article also focused on emerging prosperity gospel prophets and pastors, as was Lauterbach's work, though in his case in Accra rather than Kumasi, the Swami argues that far from the amoral neoliberal profiteers that so many imagine these figures to be, the men he worked with are deeply committed to ethically evaluating their own characters and those of the more established Christian leaders with whom they train. Key to their evaluations is an ethical distinction they make between being a wealthy Christian and a rich one. Rich pastors and other rich Christians seek fame for their own aggrandizement and material success for their own enjoyment. The wealthy, by contrast, put their fame and their resources in the service of helping others, redistributing what they gain from their religious success. As in Lauterbach's account, the Swanee shows us that prosperity is not a simple idea, and that the prosperity gospel is not, as those who treat it as a kind of magic tend to imagine, always without ethical input. Naomi Haynes' recent book, Moving by the Spirit, furthers our understanding of the economic aspects of the prosperity gospel along these lines, while also introducing us to a different aspect of its cultural logic. This one related to its patterns of strong pastoral authority that, supported, that support markedly hierarchical church structures in which pastors, <coughs> seen as models of God-given success and conduits of divine power, are elevated high above their flock. As with their focus on earthly success, this aspect of prosperity churches is one that often worries observers, anthropologists included, who are, who are often inclined to see it as a move toward authoritarianism. Haynes comes to a different conclusion. Haynes carried out her work on the Zambian cap copper dog. By the time she began her field work in 2006, the economic boom times that once characterized copper dog life were long over. If not destitute, the people she studied were certainly not well off and they were much poorer than they or the generation of their parents had expected that they would be. The economic ground having shifted underneath their feet, one might expect Haynes to see these Zambians turn to prosperity churches, <coughs> which there are hundreds in the town she studied, as representing just the kind of desperate grab at a simplistic and faulty framework for understanding the harsh and global world they inhabit that some anthropologists would expect them to make. But Haynes' analysis doesn't follow this, this line. Through careful cultural and historical analysis, Haynes shows that the Zambians she studies are heirs to a tradition that has long favored the creation of patron-client relationships that connect people across differences in power and resources. To participate in such links is, as they told her, to realize the value of moving, moving upward in various hierarchies in which they participate. And this is the value they find it most important to pursue. In their churches, when they pray for blessings, or what they call breakthroughs, it's this kind of hierarchical movement that they hope to produce. And often they do produce this value in their Christian lives. For the fostering of relations with powerful pastors and through them with the Holy Spirit and God constitutes success in this endeavor. 
Prosperity here is not the fulfillment of selfish or illegally informed individual desires for material goods for their own sake, nor a torn turn toward the acceptance of authoritarian leadership. It is instead a relationally expansive kind of advancement that puts Copper Belt Prosperity Churches at the center of people's efforts to build valued kinds of community during materially difficult times. Along with its contributions to the anthropology of Christianity, Haynes' work participates in a major reevaluation of the, of the cultural role of hierarchy that's underway in the anthropology of Africa and other world regions, a reevaluation that moves beyond liberal assumptions about the authoritarian sterility of hierarchical systems. Core to Haynes' argument is the claim that Bemba, the ethnic group that makes up the bulk of the membership of the churches she studies, have always valued differences in rank and status, seeing the ability of people to find places in properly formed hierarchies as central to the creation of good lives. Classic early work on the Bemba by Audrey Richards confirms that this is a cultural theme of long standing. Part of Haynes' point is that during the years in which the copper belt economy was thriving, these hierarchies could be based on differences in wealth and the formation of patron-client relations that such wealth allowed. But with the end of the boom time, such hierarchies became harder and harder to sustain in material terms. The prosperity God churches have responded to this situation by making it possible to rebuild such hierarchies on the basis of differentials in spiritual power. To use a term that Haynes and other anthropologists do not deploy, and that I will come back to only later as a theological term, we might argue that among the Bemba, prosperity churches represent a productive contextualization of Christianity that allows it to speak meaningfully to core Bemba values that promote the pursuit of wealth and the alliance with powerful leaders, not for the ways they support self-centered consumption or authoritarian governance, but rather for the kind of expansive sociality that they foster. Returning the anthropological idiom I've been relying on throughout this section, we can argue, as Haynes in fact does, that the Christian belief in the Holy Spirit's readiness to give gifts to believers and in God's commitment to use his power to help people fight against evil have become tightly interwoven with more traditional Bemba ideas to form an elaborate cultural logic that appeals to many of those currently struggling with economic decline in the towns of the Copper Belt. Now, one thing that's common to the authors I've discussed so far and to others who have more recently studied the prosperity gospel is that they strive to adopt a generally non-judgmental stance that has, at least until recently, been a hallmark of anthropological writing. They do not come to pronounce on the value of prosperity churches in relation to some explicit fixed standard of the good life, and their concern, as anthropologists almost always are, to show that, show that the church members that they study do not live less than human lives devoid of intelligence or of social and moral concern. Everyone, as the old relativist saw has it, makes sense in their own terms. Coleman, Wiley, Louderback, Baswani, and Haynes show us that this is as true of prosperity gospel followers as it is of anyone else. But the disciplinary centrality of this goal of rendering those we study in complicated, fully human terms can leave anthropologists tongue-tied in cases where they worry that they cannot reach it. In my experience, this kind of difficult situation very rarely arises. Or maybe it just appears not to arise, because when it does, anthropologists abandon the project at hand, and news of such cases never reaches the literature. But recently, one anthropologist has found herself unable to fully realize the goal of rendering all of those she studies wholly sympathetic vis-a-vis -vis her fieldwork in a prosperity gospel church, and has had the courage to write a major anthropological study in spite of the difficulties that her situation presents. Ilana Van, Wick, uh, Ilana Van Wick, the anthropologist in question, carried out substantial ethnographic fieldwork with members of the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God in Durban, South Africa. The Universal Church is widely known as one of the paradigm cases of successful cultural religious globalization from the south to the south and the south to the north. Since its founding in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1977, it has spread to at least 60 countries and in 2005, it was opening a new branch, a new church every week in South Africa. I'm sure it's in Helsinki, but I didn't Google it. It's certainly in San Diego, where I sometimes am in the US. The Universal Church is solidly in the prosperity tradition. Like other prosperity churches I've discussed, it promises followers that strong faith and generous pies will result in their substantial material enrichment on Earth. And like many of them, it adds to this the claim that one reason churchgoers sometimes fail to prosper is that they're blocked by demons 
who hold them back. Much of church practice, therefore, takes the form of spiritual warfare aimed at binding and vanquishing such demons so that members can be free to achieve success. The book that Men Wick has written on the basis of her fieldwork is entitled The Universal Church of the Kingdom of God in South Africa, The Church of Strangers. The subtitle of the book neatly reveals its core argument. The church in Durban, which she shows in great detail, does nothing to build a community among its members. There are no small groups, little by way of development projects or charitable good works, and the leadership moves pastors regularly to prevent them from becoming too close with those who attend his services. More than this, sermons regularly focus on the claim that the demons said to block believers' access to God's bounty can deceitfully take the form of people they might find appealing, such as those sitting next to them in the pews. It's not surprising, then, that church members mostly keep to themselves, and even the relatively small number who attend the church year after year tend to have few relationships with other members. Alongside the isolating talk of demonic omnipresence, Demands for ties and other gifts to the church are constant and sometimes accompanied by threat. One pastor even insisted that, I'm quoting her now, old women who hid money, hid money in their bras for the taxi fare home would be killed or maimed en route, while parents who paid school fees instead of ties would see their children fail or die. Such tactics are deployed in a context where the gifts that many of the very poor congregants give, give to the church serve to estrange them from their families who are enraged by the diversion to the church of what little funds are available for pressing household needs. So people are also becoming isolated from their families by participating in this church. It's hard to escape the suspicion that we are here in the presence of Percy's abusive religion, a hard case for the anthropological impulse to dwell on complication and strive to make sense of people's lives around. It's to Manowick's credit that she acknowledges the difficulty this church presents to her as an anthropologist. In her book, she is open in her dislike of the church as an institution, and she's written a very searching article in which she counters the often implicit anthropological assumption that liking those whom we study is a crucial part of anthropological method. But it is also telling that in the end, that wit's into, into anthropological training leaves her with few tools for elaborating her unhappiness with the church into a securely grounded judgment upon it. <coughs> That's kind of the core of what I'm trying to get at here. Instead, that training leads her to, conclude, to conclusions very close to those of the other contemporary anthropologists of the, pros of the prosperity gospel whose work I've just discussed. Let me quote her at some length to give you the sense of the flavor of her conclusions. This is her. While unbelievers to whom she presented her were shocked by the meanness, selfishness, and violence of the universal church that the universal church apparently inspired, strong members insisted that this was part of their warrior ethic. I chose to write about this ethic, not to confirm secular suspicions about the church's depravity, but to illustrate the depth of their belief and the fundamentally positive social goals to which their behaviors were ultimately directed. Indeed, church members believed that through sacrifices, strong behavior, and steadfastness, they could reinstate God's blessing in the lives of their families. Theirs was not, or well, selfish, faith. In the end, Van Wick too ends up arguing that those who attend the universal church she studies in Durban are not less than full human beings, possessed of intelligence, moral impulses, and social concern. I applaud her for this, and as an anthropologist, I would not have wanted her to come to any different conclusion. But it's worth pointing out that her work shows us clearly that it would, when it comes to the matter of critical judgment on the lives of those they study, the anthropological spade is turned. And this is true even when we manage, as Van Wick has very, very impressively, to convey material that seems to cry out for a different kind of judgment. This is, I think, an important point of contrast with the way theologians carry out their work. So now let me, this is now a section on theology called Theology, Judgment from the Prosperity Gospel. I've already quoted some of the harsher judgments theologians have made about the prosperity gospel. What interests me now is the theological reasoning processes that lead them to these judgments, reasoning processes in which anthropologists tend not to engage. How is it, I want to ask in anthropological fashion, that some theologians can fit such practices of judgment into their own scholarly lives, lives that make sense, I presume, on their own terms? 
An initial observation to make is that in the sources I've looked at to this point, I'm impressed with what I take to be a stance of humility theologians tend to maintain in the judgment process. Even the harsh pronouncements I quoted earlier were made by scholars who had done a lot of work to reach their conclusions. And in most texts I've encountered, the authors are careful to acknowledge their own limitations when it comes to rendering judgment on forms of the Christian faith they do not themselves practice. Several are also keenly aware of the caution theologians who have com relatively comfortably in the global north need to exercise when approaching churches that appeal so strongly to those living far more precarious lives than their own. But theological humility does not go so far as suspending judgment altogether, as one can argue anthropological humility does as a matter of method and sometimes of theory, which I'll come back to. In the end, theologians are charged with making what Nancy Tanner, a very prominent theologian, refers to as, quote, normative theological judgments, judgments about what is authentically Christian, close quote. And it is from the vantage point of this requirement that they ultimately approach the prosperity gospel. Within the text that I've looked at, the process of reaching such judgments tends to proceed along one of two lines. This is something like an ethnography, a, a very, very preliminary ethnography of theological reasoning and practices in a not completely random, but not completely systematic set of theological <coughs> texts. So within the text I've, I've looked at, the process of reaching such judgments tends to proceed along one of two lines. Some check the accuracy of the biblical pronouncements of prosperity preachers against other, more widely academically acceptable ways of interpreting specific texts that they cite. Along with many others, the well-known Pentecostal, Pentecostal biblical scholar Gordon Fee takes this approach, finding prosperity interpretations to be, quote, purely subjective and arbitrary. He offers as a case in point the common prosperity understanding of, um, of, of, of chapter 3, verse 2 of John. In the King James Version, this reads, quote, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. If one returns to the Greek and explores the way the language was used at the time this was written, he argues, it's clear that this is a standard formal reading, like I hope you are well, and not an assertion that believers should or that they actually have a right to prosper as prosperity preachers tend to interpret. An expanded form of such critiques, based in biblical scholarship and hermeneutic criticism, checks the prosperity gospel against traditional Christian teachings more broadly, and also finds them wanting. In this form of critique, it's common to note that the roots of the prosperity gospel are not social, solely Christian. For new thought and Gnostic ideas have also been in the mix from the origin of this movement in the United States. Likewise, the prosperity tendency to assert that the Bible is in effect a contract with believers and that those who pray strongly and tithe regularly obligate God to deliver them blessings are often classed as magical practices that do not recognize traditionally normative Christian notions of God's sovereign freedom. This point is tied to another, to which I'm going to return more extensively later, which is that the prosperity gospel may well have a theological anthropology that is too high, a, a view of human beings that, that exalts them too much and gives them too much power, defining them as capable of too much and God correlatively of too little. As Leonard Lovett puts the matter, quote, the emphasis in the prosperity gospel movement, its critics contend, raises humankind to God's level and thereby creates a false pride that generates the belief that humans can save themselves from disaster by claiming their divine right. A second line of critical investigation does not set the prosperity gospel against the measuring stick of the Bible or that of the Christian tradition but instead looks more closely at the situations in which followers of the prosperity gospel live their lives and asks in what are called correlational or contextual terms whether that gospel succeeds in rendering the Christian message meaningful for people in their own circumstances. This work can sometimes make use of anthropological methods and even findings as it aims to capture the complicated lives that prosperity Christians live. Mika Vahakangas, for example, draws on Haynes's work, which as I noted we might see as showing how the prosperity gospel can be contextualized in terms of traditional Zambian, Zambian values of hierarchical moving, to point out that African migrants to Finland define prosperity in traditional social relational terms. He makes this point in the course of arguing that African concerns, as much or even more than neoliberal ones, are part of the foundations of the faith of these migrants. But in theological hands like Bahakangas's, embedding the prosperity gospel in the wider social context of which it forms a part is not a substitute for judgment, but 
but a prelude to it. For there's always the possibility for contextualization to go too far. Becoming the cases under consideration, what the Pentecostal theologian Frank Machia calls, quote, a heretical accommodation of the gospel to the larger cult of personal prosperity that lacks faithfulness to vital elements of the gospel that might challenge the priorities of capitalist economics. Or that similarly takes to accommodating an approach to indigenous cultural concerns that may have come to address. In this spirit, Bahakangas ends his largely positive contextual account of the migrant church he studied in Helsinki by acknowledging that, quote, the unanswered question that we are left with is whether a church whose message is aimed almost exclusively at the successful and socially attractive, or those in root, can really be a church for everyone. Thus, even when theologians tap closest to anthropologists in their approach to the prosperity gospel, the call to Tanner's requirement of theological judgment remains in their ears to prevent any collapse of disciplinary identities. Okay. Now, this section is called Anthropology and Theology on Judgment and the Nature of the Human. Having arranged a meeting between the anthropology and theology on the globally expansive grounds of the prosperity gospel, I want to bring my discussion to a rather long conclusion. I didn't want you to get too excited. You know, as as you <laughs> but we could negotiate it. Well, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, 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 a rather long conclusion. It won't go on forever. It's, it's not too many so long. Uh, by considering the opportunities this encounter may hold for enriching anthropological thought through the engagement of theological categories or with theological categories. I'm going to focus on two issues around which I think such an engagement can be productive. One, that of judgment, I've already introduced. The other, having to do with what were for me at least some unforeseen similarities in both disciplines' fundamental views of humanity, I will turn to in closing out my discussion. The point I've already made, that, that, that uh, anthropology and theology are different from each other um, in that practices of judgment are central to some branches of theology and almost forbidden in anthropology, may seem a bit too obvious to bear even the attention that, that I've already given, given to those ideas. Those who have been through the battles that beset the relationship between religious studies and theology must feel like they've heard some version of this kind of observation before. But the framework of those discussions tends to be set by the notion of normativity. The key question being, how can disciplines that are normative and those that are not sit side by side? I have very deliberately avoided that framework by choosing judgment as the axis around which my argument has turned. Granted, normativity and judgment are closely related, but I don't think they're the same. And this is even more true if one thinks of judgment as an activity, as I've been thinking of it here. If it is common now, and not only for postmodernism, to acknowledge that all disciplines are inescapably normative, whether they admit it or not, there are right ways to do it. Other disciplines you'd like to name, and wrong ways of doing any disciplines. So all disciplines are normative in that sense. But even if that's true, it is an observable feature of academic life that not all disciplines aim at rendering explicit judgment on the objects that they study. It is in this respect that at least some branches of theology and anthropology appear to differ. In an important article that first set me on the path to considering the issue of judgment, the anthropologist, but with extensive theological training, Patrick McKierney, has discussed the difference between anthropologists and religious ethicists in detail. He works with the distinction between description and judgment, arguing that for many, though not all anthropologists, description is the core disciplinary goal while judgment is ruled out of bounds. This stance does not follow primarily from worries about how normative commitments can compromise descriptive objectivity. It's not that people don't want to render judgment because that would make them less than objective in their, in their, in their field work and their writing. But it's rather based on a conviction, it's rather based on a conviction that presenting detailed descriptions of how other people live is in itself an ethical practice one that ideally expands the moral imaginations of those who read such descriptions by displaying the richness and coherence of the lives that they depict. One might argue that anthropologists achieve this effect because in crafting their descriptions, they implicitly judge the cultural formations they present to display the virtues of complexity, livable coherence, and meaningfulness. 
But as I noted when discussing Van Wyck's ethnography, since anthropologists almost never fail to demonstrate that cultural formations meet the standards, the fact that their descriptions carry such judgments remains in the background. Moreover, at least in practice, anthropologists very rarely make any other judgments beyond these implied ones. They worry that, the worry that lies behind this tendency to restrict the discipline's judgmental palette is surely, I think, that the ethically beneficial effect of using descriptions to expand the moral imagination of readers would be vitiated if anthropologists noisily added their own explicit judgments on various cultural elements they describe to the portraits of the way of life they provide. That's contentious and we could discuss it, but I think one reason we don't load our text with judgments is we think they won't do the work they're supposed to do if, if people think that we're just pushing, we're just using our ethnographic descriptions as sort of cutting horses for our own judgmental but there are probably there are there are other reasons I'm about to get to one that we also exclude judgment from our text. And and so I would add to McCurney's argument about the ethical description in anthropology, the further observation that the disciplinary suspension of judgment is also a result of the role of the positive doctrine of relativism, itself once normative and disciplined, and the role that that's had in rendering the withholding of judgment itself a virtuous act. Remember, anthropology, or at least American anthropology, is the discipline that once registered an official dissent during the comment period for the 1948 UN Declaration of Human Rights, expressing the concern that its focus on the claims of individuals might be culture bound. It should come as no surprise then that for generations, anthropologists have been carefully, and often implicitly, trained in how to withhold judgment. Put more positively, they've been led pedagogically to test themselves against all kinds of ethnographic reports that challenge their own normative sensibilities. Reports about, just to give a few examples, unfamiliar, unfamiliar organizations of gender roles, rites of passage that subject initiates to intense pain, or culturally expected infanticide, while being asked to learn to bracket those sense, their own sensibilities in order to work toward figuring out how all groups of people make sense in their own terms. I think it's fair to say that almost no one gets out of a first-year anthropology course without encountering at least some practice or set of ideas that initially appears inexcusable by the standards the students have brought with them to the course, but that is ultimately shown to fit meaningfully within the cultural formations of which it is a part. This educational tradition of training people to suspend judgment, at least long enough to look for the indigenous ethical values on display in complex cultural descriptions, has a lot to do with anthropology's unique place in the intellectual universe. But the emphasis on this kind of teaching has also meant that anthropologists are not well trained in making explicit judgments when they might want to. For this reason, when they do make judgments, they often tend to be quite obvious ones, easily accepted in the cultures from which the anthropologists themselves come, and short on the very complexity on which the discipline of art prides itself. For reasons I can't go into here, but be fun to take up elsewhere, um, and we'll talk about more tomorrow. I think that anthropologists are making more and more of these kinds of judgments now, and that relativism is in quite a bit of disarray. Personally, I hope the relativist, relativist tradition will survive in some form, and that is kind of what the paper tomorrow is about. But whether it does or not, its current difficulty suggests that this is a good moment for anthropologists, more and more inclined to render judgments, to come into dialogue with theologians about the procedures their disciplines develop for teaching scholars how to judge their objects of study with humility and on the basis of explicit standards that have been hammered out over a long history of scholarly effort. I could have made, um, I could have made this argument about the potential benefits of a discussion between anthropology and theology about judgment, even without a consideration of the two parties' divergent approaches to the prosperity gospel. Though I hope that, a consideration, that, 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 that looking at the prosperity gospel helped to focus some of the issues in play. The other topic I want to suggest is ripe for its change between the two fields is one that might not have stood out so clearly without the provocations that the prosperity gospel provides. I've already noted that some theologians worry about what they call the very high theological anthropology that underwrites the prosperity doctrine. It holds that believers have great power and that they can assure their own salvation through their cultivation of a strong faith. In this view, God has little to do beyond meeting his obligations when believers meet theirs. It is the power accorded to human action in this scheme that leads some theologians, and I think the anthropologists alike, to class it as very nearly a form of magic. 
I generally avoid. Uh, okay, I generally I generally avoid making generalizations about theology. I have this undertaking when faced with an enormously diverse field that one does not know, as it were, from an insider's perspective. But I do wonder if there are any many academic theologians who subscribe to a vision of humanity akin to that of the prosperity gospel believers, one that gives individuals quite so much of the power of their own and expects that almost by themselves human beings can wholly control their own spiritual and material destinies. And put in just this very general way, one that you might have noticed or not, sets God and salvation aside, I can say with more confidence that anthropologists are right there with theologians on this point. I think that the point that human beings kind of can't do it on their own, or individual human beings. I can begin to illustrate this point by noting that Clifford Pierce famously laid out the most general philosophical anthropology that underlies sociocultural anthropology. Well, um, very quickly, so theological anthropology is the, is the theological study of the doctrine of humanity, of what human beings are. Philosophical anthropology is the philosophical study of what human beings are. A so when I want to talk about how, what, what, how anthropology, <laughs> anthropologists see what human beings are, yeah, this isn't the best talk to me. It's not flame, but you know. Um, I, I tend to call it anthropology's philosophical anthropology. So do your best to keep up. I could have used subscript ones and subscript twos, but they don't work so well verbally. So I can begin to illustrate this point by noting that Clifford Geertz famously laid out the most general philosophical anthropology that underlies sociocultural anthropology when he wrote that human beings are, quote, incomplete animals. In contrast to other animals, Geertz notes, human behavior is governed very little by instinct. Furthermore, human infants are born remarkably unfinished, or, as it's often put, helpless. Human individuals thus require upbringing and a culture to allow them to meaningfully comprehend the world around them and to make anything of their lives. Other anthropological theorists would stress human dependence on social relations in society more generally, where here it stresses culture. Can you tell any recently moved to England? But all of them, all anthropologists, come together in the broad belief that individuals are never on their own able to create truly human lives for themselves. Anthropology, then, is a discipline founded on a notion of the incompleteness of the individual and its lack of self-sufficiency. That's just often the case one finds when one wants to chase these things down. Hertz offers no scholarly source for his notion of human incompleteness. But it's clear that he is either directly or indirectly drawing on the 20th century tradition of philosophical anthropology associated with the German thinkers Max Scheler, Arnold Galen, and Helmut Plessner. It was this group of thinkers that most systematically and influentially linked the relative lack of instinctual governance of, governance of human behavior to the need individuals have for something beyond themselves to be help, help them create a world in which to live. In light of this genealogy of Geertz's immensely influential anthropological view of the nature of human beings, it is noteworthy that the very influential theologian Wolfhard Pannenberg, who has something like Geertz's status or had in, in, in theology, opens his massive work, Anthropology and Theological Perspective, with a substantial engagement with these same scholars who Geertz is definitely drawing from philosophers. The goal of, of, of Pannenberg's book overall is to demonstrate that modern secular accounts of the nature of, of the human, of the kind the philosophical anthropologists offer, always, as it were, back onto or can be revealed to require or presuppose theological ideas, thereby inadvertently clearing a place in the discussion of the nature of the human for a discipline that many parties to that discussion may have imagined their work to have rendered irrelevant. So he wants to say, look, I'm even going to be able to draw. Shaler was not really a secular thinker, but that's complicated. But the other ones were. And Pannenberg's will say, look, I can draw on these very specific secular things and show you how they presuppose theological ideas and how they require them. Um, the next seven minutes or so are some pretty heavy theology. Which for the anthropologist will give you a chance to hear what this sounds like. I hope we got the time and the seven minutes for that, three to conclude. Um, if, you, if you don't want to hear the theology on that. But I think it makes a very interesting contrast with here and it turns into a pretty, a pretty interesting um, uh, carnival, distorting the brain anthropological thought. To launch the first of his arguments about, about how philosophical anthropology ends up requiring theology. Pannenberg takes from the German philosophical anthropologist not only the notion of individual human incompleteness that Geertz borrows, 
but also the allied one was associated with shale of human openness to the world. The argument goes like this. Because human perception is not tuned only to triggering instinctual responses, it's capable of taking in much more of the world than animal perception does. Plessner, on Panenberg's reading, builds on this point to focus on the way human beings are regularly carried beyond themselves by their perception of the objects of the surrounding world and thus become what he calls exocentric creatures that know themselves as selves only by virtue of also knowing the world beyond themselves. Pannenberg adds to this claim the observation that people know any particular object only by situating it against its own horizon, which is external to itself. And this process holds in turn for each horizon itself, right? So I only can perceive this table by looking against the horizon of everything behind it and in this room. You get it, right? Simple. <laughs> um, for this reason, because of every, every object we would ever perceive stands against the horizon, and that holds for every horizon we would ever perceive. For this reason, um, in transcending themselves to engage the world of objects, human beings, by their very nature, come to recognize the notion of the infinite in the form of constantly expanding horizons. It is in this notion of a necessary moment of recognition of the infinite, Kahneberg suggests, that secular philosophical anthropology points to a realm that's proper to theology. <coughs> this last step toward the infinite is, of course, the most important one for Kahneberg. But before exploring where it gets it, I want to just stop just short of where he goes from there to highlight how closely the model of humanity he has laid out to this point fits the anthropological one offered by Geertz. That human beings are not self-sufficient, that they are completed or given the chance to lead meaningful lives not through their own self-determination, but by coming into contact with the world beyond themselves is central to both visions. Later in his book, Pannenberg will populate this outside world not just with the generic notion of particular objects that people perceive, but with society, language, history, and other anthropologically recognizable phenomena. Even before he gets to the infinite and the divine, then, Pannenberg shares with social anthropology a low view of human individuals, one that stresses their dependence on something beyond themselves. Returning to the development of Pannenberg's argument, it's important to note that having worked through the main philosophical anthropological arguments by instinctual apology, world openness, and exocentricity, and found that they lead to intimations of the infinite, infinite Pannenberg also offers a lengthy discussion of how these notions can be reread in theological terms. So now he's shifting from reviewing these philosophical anthropologists to doing his own theological work. And he begins this task by considering Herod, who he takes to have originated the argument about human reliance on cultural over instinct and thus philosophical anthropology itself. What's of most interest to Pannenberg and Herder's work is his understanding of scriptural references to human beings being made in the image of God. Herder's position on the meaning of this complex idea, which Pannenberg adopts, is that human beings do not by nature embody the image of God, but rather by nature have the potential to do so. As Pannenberg puts it in another of his writings, part of human incompleteness consists in the way people are, quote, not complete from the start as the image of God, in the image of God, as the image of God. It is human destiny from birth to come to realize this image, but this is, quote, a destiny that is to be realized only in the future. Jesus has already shown us that this goal can be attained, and, quote, this sets the theme for all subsequent history. But this goal, but this is a goal that human beings do not attain just by being born and, quote, cannot reach by themselves. As philosophical anthropology has shown, Pannenberg concludes, individuals will have to go outside themselves becoming exocentric and enculturated if they are to discover infinity and from there come to realize the task of coming to be the image of God that their destiny has set for them. Having moved from philosophical anthropology to distinctly theological concerns by defining a destiny toward which human beings are directed, Hanenberg looks back on his earlier discussion to conceptualize sin in terms he's drawn from philosophical anthropology. So now he's going to translate his philosophical and theological discussion into the theological discussion of sin. Sin, he says in these terms, consists in whatever prevents human beings from realizing their destiny of coming to embody the image of God. Having argued that the human move to exocentricity, the cultivation of the human ability to go outside of the self to encounter the world of objects on their own terms, 
is the first step to discovering human destiny and beginning to take it as a goal, sin becomes any move toward too great an emphasis on drawing into and serving the self, what Pannenberg calls a drift toward overwhelming egoism or centrality. Human perception always begins in emphasis, he says, in egoism. So struggles to balance egoism and excentricity is part of, quote, the structure of human existence. For this reason, the possibility of sin is, quote, closely connected with the natural conditions of human life. But if humans are to reach their destinies, their original egoism must be overcome. They must learn to conceive of the objects of their world on their own terms, and not only in terms of the uses to which the self will put them. Given that the transcendence of the self is also an imperative in the philosophical and anthropological framework, Pannenberg's account of sin does count as a successful integration of this framework into his own theological system. But how might this vision be put in front of all this on quick inspection, what renders Tannenberg's overall definition of the human person alien to anthropology is his insistence that human life has a destiny or a telos. But is it the very notion of a human telos that distances anthropologists from a framework like Tannenberg's, or is it just the substance of the telos that he posits, which, which, which is to come to embody the image of the Christian God? I think it's clear that the substantial quality or the material quality of Pannenberg's definition of human destiny, that it, that it is to become the image of God, does open a gap between him and many sociocultural anthropologists. But what of the idea of human destiny more generally as a formal aspect of Pannenberg's anthropology? Is it possible to argue that the very notion of such a human telos has no place in sociocultural anthropology, which defines human openness as precisely an openness to a very broad, if not infinite, range of ways of life? Once one asks this question, Annenberg's anthropology can be seen as raising an issue that anthropologists have not thought about as much as they might. But at least in the piece in which Geertz discusses the notion of human incompleteness, it's evident that Geertz does treat becoming enculturated as the destiny of all human beings. He writes that, quote, undirected by cultural patterns, organized systems of significant symbols, man's behavior would be virtually ungovernable. A mere chaos of pointless acts and exploding emotions, his experience virtually is shapeless. People without culture would not be, he continues, or culture, people, people without culture would not, he continues, represent a kind of humanity in the state of nature, a baseline from which all other kinds of humanity are either a degeneration or development. Instead, they would be, quote, unknowable monstrosities with very few useful instincts, fewer recognizable sentiments, and no intellect mental basket case. Humans without culture simply are not human for years. For this reason, here says, he must state bluntly, not, we might know his usual idiom, uh, or his usual tone of voice, he says, I must state bluntly, quote, that there is no such thing as human nature independent of culture. Sensitized by Pannenberg to the role a notion of destiny can play in the construction of a philosophical anthropology, it is more than fair here to argue that Geertz and sociocultural and anthropological common sense, both before and after him, treats culture as human destiny. To fail to reach the goal of enculturation may not be a sin in such a scheme, but at least on Geertz's account, it is to fail to be human. Anthropology might then contrast this version of the destiny of humanity with the one Pannenberg promotes, but it cannot claim to have sidestepped the issue of destiny altogether. By following the philosophical anthropologist, Pannenberg and Geertz, we must appear to have wandered far from the prosperity gospel, but perhaps not as far as it may seem, or at least not so far that the road back is impossibly long. And now I really am here. For both theologians and, and sociocultural anthropologists insist that human beings do not, on their own, have the power to reach the destinies that follow from the kinds of beings that they are. If they need a world outside themselves, and one that is populated not only with objects, but with other people in various social and cultural phenomena, then any cultural scheme that suggests individual self-sufficiency as either a fact or a destiny must be fundamentally an error. Anthropologists might be, still be interested in how such a cultural scheme makes sense in its own terms, but they cannot go so far as to call it correct. Another great anthropologist, who there's no time to discuss in detail here, Louis Dumont, makes this point without diluting its complexity. <coughs> he suggests that while there surely are cultural formations that make individualism their highest value, 
They must have levels that they fail to recognize explicitly, or even actively obscure, value the social as well. This is so because living in a society is a fundamental condition for the achievement of true humanity. It's human destiny, in Pierce, in Lord Pannenberg's term. For anthropologists who take this view, and for theologians who, like Pannenberg, think it's crucial to the achievement of, of human destiny that people go outside themselves, it would be hard not to recoil from what one theologian calls the triumphalism, or what I might call the individualist triumphalism, of some formulations of prosperity gospel, and to be chilled by the portrait of the church Van Wick describes, um, inasmuch as it appears det determined to sever as many of its members' social ties as it can. If nothing else, the low quality of the basic anthropologies I have examined in sociocultural anthropology and in some versions of theology lead the two disciplines toward this shared view. And I suspect this point of intersection could well become one around which to build future interdisciplinary dialogue. I want to close with a final brief observation. If both sociocultural anthropologists and at least some theologians define the human nature as a being with a destiny, there's perhaps a difference in the point at which scholars in the two disciplines imagine that people are capable of achieving that destiny. For anthropologists, the vast majority of people begin reaching the goal of acquiring a culture pretty much from the moment of birth. And almost all of them succeed in reaching the required level of accomplishment in this area from very early in their lives. Patrick McKierney, whose work on judgment I mentioned earlier, and Tyler Zwani have pointed out that the rapidly developing anthropology of intellectual disability may begin to challenge this assumption and could perhaps rattle in a more profound way the philosophical anthropology of which it is a part. But at present, there does not exist an anthropology of those who do not come to bear culture because there is little room in the discipline's philosophical anthropology for such people to exist. For Pannenberg, and perhaps in the work of at least some other theologians, the road to the achievement of human destiny is longer than it is in anthropology, and the threat of failure is more real. And it occurred to me reading this paper on the plane that maybe that's why theologians cultivate the practice of judgment more explicitly, because they don't take for granted the achievement of human destiny quite in the way that anthropologists do. And we have to think that through more fully. Anyway. This introduces. Um, Okay, the fact that, that, it, that, that it takes a lot longer in, in Pannenberg's view to achieve human destiny than it does in, in anthropological versions introduces a number of differences between the two anthropological visions, that is, visions of humanity. Here I want to mention just one. Anticipation and ultimately eschatology are major categories for Pannenberg. In his work on anthropology, he draws on the philosophy of history to suggest that anticipation of the future is built into human ways of relating to the world and the future is one of the horizons against which all objects are viewed. And as what is perhaps an even more profound level, the incompleteness of the human person of necessity orients them to the future. As the anthropologist Will Rawlison has recently noted, the future is not the most robust of anthropological concepts. And this is particularly true if one looks for studies of a truly open future, rather than for those that reckon the future as just one more culturally defined actor's category. Perhaps anthropologists might learn from theologians like Pannenberg then how to approach this topic in new ways. And I'll stop there. That's really meant to set up the next lecture, which is not anthropology, but I'm not going to give you that, <laughs> which I'm sure you're going to Thank you very much.
by and large, even when, then, when their object of study is religion. Mm. So I really thank you for that. But my question is to, on a more, not, not on, on your own prosperity gospel or uh, on, on your subject matter as such, but rather on the disciplinary study of these issues, where would you place sociology of religion, uh, religious studies, yeah. which by and large, more than systematic theologians or uh, use uh, ethnographic methods, uh, but, you know, study, but also put that into dialogue of you know, yeah. what you call theology. So I see as, you know, you say anthropology and theology, but there is a whole uh, disciplinary space in between those where I would place sociology of religion and, and religious yeah. studies by and large. Mm. And, and there you are probably familiar with the notion of religious religion, yeah. which is now a kind of new paradigmatic yeah. way of approaching yeah. religion which does not look, which does not only look at the practices, right. or uh, not only as the theories and texts, but try really to understand what does it mean that it's religion as religion. Yes. So I see that as the connection in, a, in the work of those people as a connection between mm -hmm. the disciplines and maybe, yeah. how, how would you see that? That's a really interesting question. And, and I, you know, um, <coughs> I think national, national traditions, I, I mean, I know that in the United States, and I don't, I, I think this is true in Europe as well, um, there's a, there's a fair, fairly large amount of sociology of religion that is funded by churches, that is done, done, done to answer questions that churches want answered. There's, you know, there's a distinction sociologists make that anthropologists interestingly don't make between medical sociology and sort of, or sociology of medicine and sociology in medicine. And I think that sociology has the same kind of issue in relation to religion which I don't think anthropology almost ever has. I mean, it's not that it's impossible, but we don't have a deep, I mean, yeah. I remember, and so I knew that from the US. I don't, I don't, um, you know, I, there, I, there are some sociologists and religion who study liberal religion like Nancy Ammerman or yeah. something like that, who, who read to me like anthropologists, where, right. where um, but, but I, would, I, I can't claim to really know their this. I mean, part of this, I don't know if this comes through, but this is trying to be an ethnography of anthropology also, yes. as well as theology. That's what all the simple yes. statements are. Yes. They're kind of the, they're kind of like you know when you like what David Schneider do with American kinship. You know, American kinship sounds really banal when you boil it. But the point is, did you get to the right sort of thing? I can't do it with theology. With religious studies, I mean. The, in the, in the United States, where it exists in a particular legal context, where state universities are not allowed to have theology departments, and there's a lot of tension around religious studies versus theology, often in the same departments. I, I, I have given this paper, you know, I gave it at the Divinity School Cancer Council, and um, people have the, the normative stuff just drives them nuts, because they fought with each other over that for so long. And, and again, a lot of them have gotten to this point where, well, look, everybody's normative, which, which I think is fine. But I think that this judgment issue is slightly different. My guess is, but this, again, it's not, doesn't come from the kind of knowledge of anthropology I have, is that religious studies people probably are more like anthropologists and they're not, they don't have very explicit criteria for writing judgments on what they study. And I'm not saying all theologians render such judgments either, but some of them have training in how they might do that, and I think that's a huge difference. So I, 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 I would be more interested to hear your views because you have inhabited some of these worlds, but I, I, I can't get some, but I think it's a great question. It would actually be an interesting thing to do a whole volume of the relation of all the different social sciences. I don't respect the divide, so I, yeah. <laughs> I don't really. Yeah. No, and that, that's a very long reason. And that uh, takes guts not to, right? <laughs> it's not, not expected as a project. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, three more. Uh, Sarah, and then there. <laughs> Just a very quick one. You know, uh, judgment. Um, it, 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 and, and anthropology is engagement with that very yeah. interesting set of thoughts. Um, generally, my reading of that book is 
very judgmental of us. We oh. avoid judging them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I had a second question, which I could do with the other one, but I'll say that. That's, that's great. I mean, I think that's what I was trying to get to in a kind of ham way, borrowing a little bit from that McKierney about the idea that by presenting other ways of life in coherent ways, but not judging them, we, we aim to expand the sort of moral language for our leaders. But in fact, I suppose we do do that by implicitly casting, and those maybe are the kind of judgments we do know how to make them good at. Um, and then there's the kind of occidentalizing judgment, which we're a little more self-critical about when we get frank about that. And I have a tiny bit of in this paper. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I'll have to think about that. But maybe it's <coughs> something that's a little tangled in that section. And part of it may be, but again, it is an implicit judgmental practice. We're not so good at saying, here are the criteria by which we're rendering these judgments, and, and, and here's why we think these are the right ones. Does that make sense? But I think you're absolutely right that part of the, part of the what I presented is kind of just expanding people's moral imagination as a critique of where they start from. Mm -hmm. A judgmental. Thank you, Professor Robin, for the lecture. Uh, only a uh, MA student, so this might make a full of name. I'm less than that in theology, so. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I do agree with you with uh, of my studies that it seems that the anthropology is in its very origin has been a you know, sort of a demystification of the other, so to say, and our main objective for hundreds of years has been uh, kind of uh, making it clear to the Western world that uh, other people are also human beings. But uh, nonetheless, I would have to disagree with you about uh, anthropology as not containing tools for presenting judgment on mm. things. And here I would go to count such works as uh, anthropology of political movements, yeah. uh, like in uh, South America, for yeah. instance. Well, more than enough, the movements themselves are religious in a sort of way. And here's my question. Uh, would it not be possible to use the concepts of the political movement, uh, analysis of political movements as a power presentation and validation of uh, opinions, for example, when looking at uh, the theological anthropology or the anthropology of uh, Presbyterian churches? And at what point does a group of religious people uh, become a movement, and uh, why couldn't it become a movement, and at what point does the religion uh, itself become something that is more political yeah. than religion in mm. nature? That's a, uh, that's a, um, the next lecture in this series is not about <laughs> but it is about how you define religious movements, and more it's about how not to, um, judgmental speaking. But, um, yeah, this isn't, this first bit isn't going to answer exactly your question, but I actually, I'm pretty critical myself of Latin American anthropology because I think that they treat political and social movements in Latin America as if they're expressions of a universal kind of social form, and they fail to recognize that they're actually a deeply complicated indigenous social form, like, say, individuals in Indonesia or something like that. I'd really like to see this notion of social movement made complicated in a way I'm not sure it is. And part of that is a constant concern with, with the political potentials, the problem with religious, um, religious hindrance to that, which I guess I would put under this, you, you might be right that they're judgmental. I don't read so much of it anymore because I wasn't getting so much out of it. But, um, but I, not, not, it's not, I mean, other people do get some out of it. I meant for my own. It wasn't grist for my own. Um, but I think that would, I would tend to include that in what I meant about rather straightforward judgments that aren't completely, I think anthropologists would have to do more work on their own definitions of politics and religion, which is really hard work. And if you then wanted to judge religions as successful or unsuccessful on the basis of how they related to those categories, you would have to develop explicit criteria for why you wanted to argue that one kind of movement was better than another. You know, in the early debates about culinary movements, you have Peter Worsley who saw them as kind of 
political movements absolutely, but in a kind of religious guise because it was the cosmos transcended any one society so you could build solidarity. And then you had Eric Hobsbawm and said, they're pre-political movements. They're kind of, they know something's wrong and they're right, people even really know something's wrong and they're right about that, but they're kind of believing themselves about how they can change it. Um, I think we have to have those kind of debates very, very frankly, again, develop criteria. I don't know if that's a great answer. I'm not a Latin Americanist anthropologist, but that, that was, would be the ways I would start to try to un untangle that one. Well, we should do something about it. It's always a great answer for any question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should start it. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you, Oli. And let's end up with Andy if nobody else has any or something. Or uh, great. Uh, uh, thank you, Joel, for this really stimulating talk. And uh, I guess my question boils down to this. Must judgment always be negative? Because it seems part of what you're, you're pushing towards is examples of condemning judgment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems to me in a lot of anthropology, at least uh, I, I feel I recurrently come across maybe a trope within anthropological writing, which is to point to some otherwise that's rooted in a cultural project, uh, often that's uh, battling against, I don't know, some neoliberalizing forces, but there's this gesture to the otherwise. Yeah. And it might be a genre of judgment that's not explicit uh, or, or one that occurs rather indirectly, but it's a way of endorsing in some sense a cultural project that is, I don't know, resisting uh, uh, some type of neoliberalizing logic or at least yeah. uh, carving out some alternative uh, social imagination or moral imagination. And I know there's one way in which you might argue that doesn't constitute judgment, but I, I would argue to you that it might be a form of a positive judgment, uh, yeah. of celebrating yeah. these projects. Uh, um, that, and yeah. I'll leave it at that. No, it's great. <laughs> I think it's actually kind of the flip side of Sarah's question. Yeah, I agree. Uh, <laughs> Perfectly so, and both of them, I mean, they're both going to find their way into a rewrite because it is clear that the, the, that, that one kind of judgment anthropologists make over and over again that this is a way of life that people are capable of inhabiting, et cetera, et cetera, is a positive judgment. And, and that's but what it, gives it's it even its critical force as a judgment uh, or at least a questioning of other ways of life. So I, but, I but I would say it's not just to say they're human, it's to say they're human and they're good. Yeah. Uh, that's where the judgment no, comes from. No, that's what I mean. Yeah. That, no, that's what I meant. They're a positive. They are a, um, you know, it's interesting. It, it, there was a discussion after all of these lectures, and it kind of got down to, well, what are anthropologists trying to do, and what are theologians trying to do? And one of the very distinguished theologians who was part of it finally said, well, you know, there are theologians who, who want to say something true about God. Because some, some people were trying to say, oh, the both disciplines are really kind of the same. And, uh, and, and she was saying, is, that, is there any way that anthropologists would ever see themselves as wanting to do that, saying something true about God? But it is true that we do want to say something true about something we think is good, <laughs> even if it's not God. So I do think, actually, at least our sort of implicit, descriptive, judgmental, description embedded judgmental practices do, do, are, do carry a kind of positive valence, which is precisely why they're meant to have a sort of critical edge when they're read. So I think that's right. And I think you are right. I tend to treat judgment here as, a, as kind of what we would like to, yeah, as an anchor. So I think that's very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You can now return your train tables to the <laughs> <laughs>